There's been a real explosion in capacity when it comes to what you can build with Microsoft Teams and on the development platform. There's lots of different ways you can build applications now that interact with Microsoft Teams. And I know it can be confusing to come to um, without any kind of context of understanding what to use, when and where. I'm going to cover three big areas of development extensibility, uh, which ones you should use when and give you some tips for how to get started. And at the end, I'm going to show you app templates as well as a really good way of jump starting your Microsoft Teams kind of development experience. So the three big areas I'm going to talk about are Microsoft Graph APIs, the Teams user UI and experience, and also bots. So let's get into it. Microsoft Graph APIs, these are really the transactional APIs. So that means like lifecycle management. It's the way you create teams, you update them, you delete them, and you gather information about them. This is all done using an Azure AD um, app application model. So it's very, very familiar. It's exactly the same as the whole of the rest of Graph. It's a common kind of methodology. Uh, if you've never done any of this before, things to think about, kind of things to be aware of. There's actually two different types of permission models. There's what's called user delegated permissions and there's application permissions. User delegated permissions really means that the as part of your application, the user will authenticate themselves. So they will sign in. If you've ever seen those pop-up boxes and then you have to kind of accept some permissions, that's user uh, that's user delegated permission. And it, what it means is that after the user has auth um, authorized themselves, any actions that the application takes are done as that user. So your permission scope is exactly whatever that user permission scope is. And any actions you take are taken by that user. Different to that are application permissions. Um, these are kind of set up by an administrator and the application is uh, has its own kind of permission set, its own identity. And actions that get taken there are done in the scope of the application, not any one user. That means that um, the user doesn't have that doesn't need to be present. There doesn't need to be a signed in user authenticating in order for the application to do its work. So that makes them ideal for kind of batch jobs or overnight jobs or anything like that where there isn't, it doesn't make sense for a user to be present. Other things you should think about. Um, the whole permission model means that um, an application is set up with a set amount of permission. Um, so the application developer defines the permissions that the application needs. Permissions to do things like read a team or write a team or update a team. And um, a tenant administrator then has to authorize those. Now, for some actions um, in Microsoft Teams, uh, the permissions that are required can be really quite wide ranging. So if you want to be able to update a specific team, maybe a team you've just created, well, you need to have update permissions across all of the teams in Microsoft Teams. And in fact, not only that, because Teams are built on groups, the permission you actually ask for is across all of the, the groups in your tenant. And that's a pretty big ask for an IT admin. There's a, there's a new, new way of doing this called resource-specific consent. This gets around this problem. It allows you, as an application, to request permission just for a very specific resource, so a particular team. And that can then be authorized by the team owner, not an IT admin. And when that happens, the application gets the permissions they need, but only very specifically for the, te uh, for the team. Now, this is not something you can do across all of Graph, and it's not something you can do across all of the team's API calls. But for the ones that where it is supported, it can be a really nice way of tightly scoping your application for the permission set it needs, but also enabling team owners to play that role of authorizing your application without needing um, an IT admin to do that for you. So that's resource specific consent. If you've never done anything with Microsoft Graph before, go and check out Graph Explorer. It's a really nice way of just understanding how Graph works, how the API calls are made, what the data return looks like. It allows you to try things out in a test tenant or in your own tenant, see real data and make commands and get the responses all inside a web page. A couple of things to be aware of when using Graph, so throttling. Um, if you do anything at scale, you'll come across Microsoft Graph throttling. And really, this is Microsoft Graph protecting itself. And there's two different types of throttling, really. The trouble really is that um, this is opaque to you. You don't know what type of throttling you're coming up against. 
Um, there's graph level throttling and there's service level throttling. So all of graph has its own throttling limits. And then within that, each service that you're calling, whether that's Teams or Groups or OneDrive or Outlook or whatever else it is, um, has its own service level limits. Um, if throttling does occur, you're going to get a very specific response, an HTTP 429 response. Sometimes you'll get a retry after header, but not always. Um, you should do the standard things that you do for throttling, so um, implement something like exponential backoff. If you uh, do get a retry after header, you should obviously use the values in that header to determine they will tell you how long you should wait before you um, go back and try again. Microsoft Teams is actually really good in this respect because they publish rate limits. Um, there's, a, there's a place you can go to uh, on the web. Um, I'll put a link uh, about now. Um, so you can go and see the rate limits and then see what they are. And, um, and, and that way you can build your application around them to make sure you are less likely to be throttled. And there are some specific rules as well for what applications should and shouldn't do. Um, you shouldn't poll more than once a day, for instance, and you should specify a date range where at all possible um, or just risk kind of, you shouldn't use it as a way to pull constantly from graph. Um, and, and if you do that, it, the documentation says that you risk being throttle, throttled or banned. Other tricks you can use. You can actually batch up graph calls um, together. Uh, you can group these non-dependent events together and have the results returned in a single batch. Um, and you can group that across workloads, which is quite interesting. You are limited to kind of 20 requests per batch. Some things are not supported. So for instance, um, get slash teams is not supported. Um, but for the, the, the workloads where it is supported, that might be really useful for you. Something else to be aware of, um, if you are getting bulk data um, and you do want to download large amounts of data in graph, you should really look at data sets and data connect data sets. Now, um, big gotcha, uh, it's not supported across um, all workloads. So specifically, Teams is not supported as a workload, but users and mail is. And if your application uses Teams information, but also uses some of those other workloads, you might find this is useful. This is ideal for getting um, access to large amounts of data very quickly. Uh, the data gets delivered to you via Azure Data Factory, um, enabling you to quickly ingest it into whatever onboard ongoing systems you have. The other thing that's worth looking at are Delta queries. So a bit like the old DirSync queries where you'd get um, a token to know how far you'd got and then you can supply that token back again to just get the difference since the last time. Very, very similar model um, in, uh, in Graph called Delta queries. Again, not supported by all workloads, but where it is, you should absolutely use them um, because it helps it helps you as a developer because you don't have to deal with duplication so much um, and it can really reduce traffic as well. Completely separate to this, a completely different way of accessing data in Graph are change notifications. So if you're at all familiar with the webhook model, um, that that's what this is. So that's what change notifications are. Um, rather than you pulling the data from Graph, um, you can subscribe to data in Graph. So um, this is this is the webhook mechanism. So where Graph delivers the data to developers. So this means no more polling. Yay, that's good. Um, and but what it also means is that when you're um, putting together your design, you can actually use things like Azure Functions. You can use other serverless architectures to um, achieve really good scale at really low cost. Uh, brand new into this model are lifecycle notifications as well. So um, what this means is uh, you can actually get notified if you have missed uh, some some notifications in your subscription um, because of permission problems or some other problem. Um, there is a li there's a whole lifecycle notification channel you can subscribe to to find out when things didn't go well. Setting up change notifications is really simple. Um, fundamentally, you, you post um, to Graph, but what you have to do is you have to tell Graph where it should call you back on. So you provide a notification URL. Um, this should be a public facing URL um, and you can put it in Azure Functions, you can put it in a website, you can do whatever you want with it really. Um, it, you, you need to give it to Graph and say, you know, I want to subscribe to whatever it is, in this case, all messages. When that happens, I want you to call me back on this URL with every time something happens that triggers this subscription. And you also have an expiry time um, because subscriptions can't be long lived. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and you pro provide all that information to Graph um, in a big post call. 
Graph will then send that endpoint um, a, a validation token. You have to send that validation token back. That's kind of like a handshake. Um, that needs to happen in order for the su subscription to be set up. It's just a way of Graph validating the endpoint that you provided. Different workloads have different expiration dates. So for instance, Teams Chats is around three days. Teams Presence is about an hour. You can always update an existing subscription though by sending through a patch request. So that's a really quick romp through what Microsoft Graph is. Let's talk now about Teams UI and the Teams user experience. We can think about this as lots of different things all tied together, but really it's a way of extending the Microsoft Teams user interface. So you'll be very familiar with tabs, I'm sure, um, within a particular channel. Um, well, they're just web pages under, you know, under the hood, they're just websites and web pages. So as a developer, you can create tabs, um, you can completely control the content of what's in those tabs. And Teams will give you some pointers as to where you are, what channel you're in, what user is accessing them to enable you to provide a really nice experience there. Messaging extensions, I really like messaging extensions. Um, uh, they're a really nice example of how you can embed and bring data in from different places. Um, I'm going to show you a demo of what they look like in a minute, but they actually also expand into things like search commands and link unfurling and action commands to really kind of make a really nice um, way of users enabling users to access disparate data, legacy data, and bring it into Teams. Task modules are a bit like pop-up dialogues, really good for collecting data from users and actioning it as well. And these shouldn't be seen as a, uh, like, you know, you've got to use one or the other. You can combine all these things together um, to, to kind of create a nice overall experience. And these combine really well with bots as well, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, for a really nice, rich experience. So let's look at two things. Um, we're going to look at messaging extension first. Messaging extensions first. Um, I just want to show you what one looks like in case you haven't seen them, um, and then I want to show you the Microsoft Teams toolkit for Visual Studio. So this is my Microsoft Teams client, and messaging extensions show at the kind of bottom where you go to start a new conversation. You see right down the bottom here, um, these are messaging extensions next to things like emojis and GIFs. Here's one I've created. So let's imagine um, a, you have a product catalog and um, you've got some legacy system that kind of has all the product codes that you need for your um, the products that you sell. And everybody in your organization is used to talking in these product codes, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six is out of stock. Um, and if you're new into that organization, it can be really confusing. You can spend your whole time looking up in the product catalog to find out what's going on. This is where something like a mess messaging extension can really help because you can bring the information from that legacy system right inside Microsoft Teams. Um, so here's a messaging extension here. It's got a product code search. So um, with messaging extensions, you can take parameters from the user and pass them to your code. So in this example, um, I'm just gonna put part of a product code in and this is all generated, um, dynamically generated demo data. So the kind of products look stupid and the pictures are just of cats, but you get the idea. It's calling my um, API service and that's returning the information from my product catalog um, that matches whatever um, product code it is that I put in. I can pull and show some nice information here. This is a nicely rendered card um, inside uh, the messaging extension experience. And what's great about this is if I choose this item, it's going to create an adaptive card and put it into the conversation that I can now begin this conversation um, inside Microsoft Teams, you know, um, uh, you know, and, and everybody sees the, the product that I'm talking about. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. There's a link to the CMS as well. Um, so these are just adaptive cards that you can build up in all sorts of ways. The real value is having that um, messaging extension in your Teams client that, so that you can kind of straight away jump to it um, without needing to kind of switch context, go out to some other system, come back again. Um, so really, really valuable um, way of bringing information from legacy systems into Microsoft Teams. The Microsoft Teams toolkit for Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code can really help you get started um, building solutions quickly by giving you scaffolding to help you get going. Um, so I'm using the Visual Studio Code Toolkit, but there's a similar one that exists for Visual Studio as well. Once you install it, um, it shows up on the left rail here as this kind of Teams icon. So 
and I've got two options here for open and uh, create a new Teams app. If I go and choose to open the Teams toolkit, this is really good documentation to everything you need to understand about what it takes to start building um, a Microsoft Teams application. So it's all the things that um, kind of tend to trip people up coming to it for the first time. So things like using Ngrok, things like enabling custom apps on your developer tenant, things like packaging your app with App Studio are all covered here. So you can step through this as a kind of handy guide to if you've never done Microsoft Teams application before, these are all the things you kind of need to know um, and kind of have in the back of your mind as you're building. The other really useful thing for me is this create a new Teams app button. So this allows you to create um, an application and it will create scaffolding for you for your first application. As you step through, it's going to create just everything you need and nothing that you don't. So you tell it what you want in your application and it will just scaffold those pieces. So for instance, if I wanted a messaging extension, um, I could just turn that on. Or if I want a tab, I can just turn that on. I'm going to go with just a tab to start with um, and click next. Uh, I get to choose my application name and uh, it's asking me some questions around do I want a personal tab or a group um, or channel tab. So um, I'm going to choose personal tab and click finish. So I'm really simple, uh, really simple one and choose where I want it to create the code to. And it's then going to go and scaffold up a load of code and drop me into this readme file. Um, so uh, this gives me everything I need now to go and build and run it. What's really interesting as well, so it's going to set up all of the, um, the NGROC stuff you need um, for local emulation. Uh, it's also packaged the app into a, a manifest file as well if I want to go and put it into Microsoft Teams and, and kind of get it running in Microsoft Teams. But right away, if I look at some of the code it's created, um, it's created lots and lots of um, kind of different files. Or like, But what really what it's done is really minimal. So this here is the kind of the only code that you'd want to change. This is the kind of shows on the tab when the tab runs. Everything else in here um, is just the kind of minimal stuff that you need to run um, kind of one of these uh, applications, all the kind of scaffolding and uh, and all the, the bare minimal, like you can see here, bare minimal CSS, minimal um, JavaScript, uh, there's a couple of different pages. Uh, you as an application, as a Microsoft Teams application, you need to have a privacy page, you need to have a terms of use page. That's why they've put them in here. Um, that's the reason for them. So that if you go and look at how it's building up the um, the manifest file, uh, then uh, you'll see that the, it's pointing to these two files as well. So that's the reason they're in there. Um, but other than that, it's, it's absolutely minimal. What's interesting as well is that they've given you a, um, a nice way of pulling out the username as well. So that can be a nice way to personalize your application. There's lots more that you can do with that um, in the Teams um, client JavaScript SDK, but it's good to see this. Um, this gives you like a good context for like, oh, okay. And if you were to go and look inside state, there's actually a lot more interesting things in there as well. Uh, and sorry, in context as well, uh, there's um, this key value pair set. There's a, there's a lot more interesting things in there as well to help you identify where your user is coming from. So I really like these as a good way of getting up and running quickly um, with kind of minimal code that is functional um, and it's a really good jumping off point to building your first application. So we've seen some different ways in which you can interact with the Teams user experience and with the Teams UI. It's You can think about how you create that and how you provide and bring all those different experiences together into one application. It's important to think about what sort of application you're making because Microsoft Teams is all about collaboration. So your application should be all about collaboration. It's worth thinking about that when you design your application out. Um, try and think about how users would communicate with each other and collaborate with each other, how they're going to share the information that you're providing into channels, for instance, to talk about it with other people. Don't drive users in a like a dead end street in your application. Always enable them to kind of come back out and collaborate and share what they're finding. Um, and, and when you're building out your application, you know, take the time to talk to users, try and understand what their needs are, draw it out with them on a whiteboard. Um, the nice thing about the Teams user experience and the user interface is that it's very visual. So people understand when you show them what can be done inside Teams, they will tell you what they want. Um, and you can put all that on a whiteboard. You can design it out in front of them um, as well. And you don't need to be a designer to do this. Just find your users and talk to them. 
So let's talk about bots specifically because everybody wants to build a bot, right? And it, it's kind of, it, you can see why, because bots are a really nice way of bringing data from different places, legacy systems, the rest of Microsoft 365, kicking off business processes, getting stuff done, but with a really nice common interface and a common experience for users as well. Users having chats with other people, having chats with bots, just the same, just to get, get gather information and get stuff done. And doing all of that inside Microsoft Teams means they don't have to leave the place where they're already collaborating. So completely makes sense. So when we think about bots in Microsoft Teams, that whole process of a bot is actually delivered by something called the Azure Bot Service. And Azure Bot Service is separate from Microsoft Teams. Um, Microsoft Teams is in, in effect a customer, if you like, of, of Azure Bot Service. The way Azure Bot Service works um, is you have an underlying um, framework called the Bot Framework. And as a developer, you build your code against the Bot Framework. So using their SDKs, using their API calls, you build a bot against the Bot Framework. And then you enable that bot for a number of different channels. Um, those channels can be things like email and Microsoft Teams. They can be things like Slack, Twilio. Um, there's a number of different providers, um, including some new ones uh, like Google Home and Amazon Alexa. Um, so you can use those um, as well. And the really nice thing about this bot framework is that, that and the really nice thing about the bot framework is that you don't need to understand the intricacies of all the different channels um, and how they work and what their like inputs and outputs are. You just write against the bot framework and then you enable these channels and the bot framework figures it out. Um, really nice example of that. Um, I wrote a, um, a bot to get my Microsoft Teams presence um, and I wrote that for um, Microsoft Teams so I could just chat with the bot and it would tell me what my presence was. An interesting exercise. Uh, and then when the Google Home and um, the Amazon skills came out, uh, I was able to just go to the bot framework and just toggle the, the channel to enable it. I didn't have to go and write any more code. The bot I'd written for Microsoft Teams just worked exactly the same as it did for Google Home. And now I was able just to talk to Google Home um, and find out, you know, get my presence instantly. Really nice, really nice touch. Just, just meant that I wasn't writing more and more code just to do all the plumbing. Because I'd written it once against the bot framework, I could just enable it um, for different channels. So I used to, let's talk about building bots then and, and what it takes to build a bot. So I've been talking about this for quite a long time and I first started doing a demo in 2017 about building a weather bot. So weather bots are, are quite a nice um, demo bot to build because everybody understands what the weather looks like and what a bot to get the weather might entail. But it's a nice example because even though by itself that's not particularly useful for an organization, actually, what does it mean to get the weather? Really, you're just calling an API to get the information you need. And that is useful to organizations. Everybody can think about a bot and think up a bot that has, you know, an API call to go and get some information that they need. So it's a it's a nice demo to do. So yeah, 2017 took me 60 minutes to do a demo from scratch of building a weather bot. So I'd go in, start writing code, and 60 minutes later we'd have a working weather bot. It probably was pretty boring because it was me kind of solidly writing code um, without having lots of time to explain particularly what I was doing. And it was terrifying to do as well because there was, wasn't any room for margin. I was writing live code every time. Um, as you can see from this picture, I actually had to bring my own keyboard to events because there was that much typing. So. Fast forward a year and that same bot, that same weather bot only took from 60 minutes, only took 30 minutes in 2018 and 2019. Why was that? Well, the Azure bot service came along and was a thing. Prior to that, you'd write in bot framework and there was no kind of hosting service. Azure bot service gave us a place in Azure where we could create a web app bot and all the plumbing was done for us. We could get started with templates and just modify them. Um, and so it made for a much easier demo. And I was telling people, you didn't need to be a developer to write bots, but I'd do this 30 minute demo and there was still code involved and people come to me after and say, you didn't tell me you don't need to be a developer, but look at all this code you still having to write. Um, and it wasn't as bad as it was in 2017, but it was still pretty bad. So what do we do now? Well, there's 
a new tool we can use to write bots in Bot Framework and on the Azure Bot Service. There's a Bot Framework Composer. So this is like a user interface for Bot Framework. Um, it was announced at Microsoft Ignite 2019 and really it allows you to build up a bot by dragging and dropping composable parts together in a nice workflow so you can build up um, capabilities of what your bot can do. You can test it with an emulator on your machine before you deploy it anywhere um, and you can drop in and examine the code anytime you want. Um, it's a really kind of nice, nice tool for building bots. I'm going to show you a demo of building a weather bot in a minute. Before I do though, it's worth thinking about and just being aware of Power Virtual Agents, completely separate to the Bot Framework Composer, um, also announced at Microsoft Ignite 2019. This is part of the Power Platform and is also a user interface for building bots, also allows you to drag parts and composable parts together onto a canvas to build up a workflow. Um, it's a slightly more, it's slightly different model. It's much more of a no code solution. It's a, like a black box um, and that's how it's pitched. The superpower for me of Power Virtual Agents is its ability to execute Power Automate flows. So if you're an organization that has lots of Power Automate flows, um, you should really look at Power Virtual Agents as a way of automating those, having users kick them off, providing the information from users that are needed to execute those flows and getting them done. Um, there's some licensing around it. Um, it's licensed um, in a couple of different models you should definitely look into. Um, there's one that's licensed per month for a number of sessions. If you're doing things um, that are just being used by Microsoft Teams, there is a free tier as well you should absolutely look into. Um, and you can also um, kind of publish these to Teams. There's a lot of overlap actually, having said they're completely different, there's a lot of overlap between Power Virtual Agents and Bot Framework. So if you've got an IT team um, that use Bot Framework, for instance, to build up um, capabilities around a certain um, piece of functionality, let's say IT ticketing, um, they can build a Bot Framework skill, which is like a composable piece of um, functionality for a bot. That skill can then be exposed to Power Virtual Agents to enable no-code citizen developers to just create a bot that maybe sometimes executes some Power Automate flows, but sometimes goes into this, um, this very specific to your organization skill that was written by the internal IT team um, as a bot framework skill. So there's lots of um, kind of interplay between the two, lots of different ways in which you can use them. So they're definitely worth checking out. Let's look at a demo of using the Bot Framework Composer to build a weather bot. So this is the Bot Framework Composer and this is my weather bot um, realized kind of inside the Bot Framework Composer. Some of these um, things that you see on the screen have actually come, they come kind of for free when you first create your Bot Framework Composer project. So for instance, this greeting flow that's happening here, I didn't write this, this, um, I think I wrote this bit in here, um, but it, it kind of comes for you um, as a, you can see what it's doing, which is quite nice. So it's a loop for each um, item in uh, the members added. So really every time uh, a user interacts with your bot for the first time, um, it's gonna say, you know, whatever you want it to say. And in, which, in this case, I'm just saying, hi, you can ask me about the weather. So this is the whole kind of greeting flow that happens. Uh, I've created my own one for the weather. Uh, I could have used Lewis um, to sort of, as the user said things, uh, evaluate um, which of the different flows to send them down. Um, I decided not to do that for this demo. I'm just using a trigger phrase. So what that means is really the user just has to type in exactly this phrase in order to kick off this flow. So it's not ideal, um, but for a demo, it's, it's quite good. It's it's a lot easier you know, than sort of getting into all the Lewis stuff. Uh, if you're building a real bot, maybe do this first and then you could add the Lewis stuff on later. Um, entirely up to you. Uh, and then after this, I'm just kind of dragging on these composable parts to build up what I need to do. So I need to first of all ask the user where they want the weather for. Then I need to go and get the weather by calling an API and then present the results onto the screen. So the first thing I do is just ask for some information. I did this by clicking the add button here and just choosing off this menu of items. So I can ask a question and I get some options now for whether it's text, whether it's multiple choice, file attachment. I can even ask for an OAuth login as well to, uh, to prompt the user to log in. Um, so I'm just asking for, uh, you know, I'm just saying where for. Um, and then here you can see this user input section. Um, I'm putting the value that the user gave me into a variable. So this property called dialog.location and that's because I need to use it later when I make my API call. 
Making the API call is really, really simple. Again, it's just a case of adding, going down to add ex access external resources and send an HTTP request. Um, that's the one I'm doing here. Uh, it's an HTTP get and I'm just putting in uh, the, let me try and find it, inside the URL, the location, um, just by using the, the curly braces, um, just putting in that property there. And again, when I get the result of that API call, I'm going to put it in its own um, property as well, dialog.weatherdata. I'm doing some simple checking to make sure um, that the status code was a 200 and not some error. Um, and I'm just using a simple kind of send a response message back. Uh, other than that, I'm then taking the weather from the content of uh, the HTTP call and then crafting a response by just poking in uh, like this nice sentence and then putting in uh, the bits that I need from the um, from the the result from the HTTP call. So a really simple process of gathering some data from the user, making an API call, sending the result set back. At any point in time, I can test what I'm doing here by clicking the test in emulator button. When I do that, it's going to open the bot framework emulator um, and it's going to put me straight into the kind of flow and you can see I get this um, greeting message that I, I spoke about. Uh, now because I was using keywords I can kick off my weather flow just by saying weather. The bot is going to say wherefore so come over here that's this bit here um, where it says wherefore. I'm going to put in a location. It's going to make that API call come back assuming everything is okay send back this response and you can see how it's inserted the values from the API call um, to make a nice sentence to tell me exactly what the weather's going to be. Really simple example um, but kind of shows how useful the bot framework can be for visualizing how a bot works and quickly building up um, flows uh, of data and um, user activity and then being able to quickly test it locally to my machine so it's worth noting I didn't deploy this I could instantly see changes so um, if I wanted to maybe change this uh, bit here that says wherefore um, I could put in um, where shall I get the weather for for instance a very simple change click restart bot um, and you can see I don't need to redeploy this anywhere I can then click test in emulator again it's going to launch the emulator and um, instantly I see my changes uh, reflected there. So it makes it much nicer for local development as well. I can very quickly iterate things and try things out. The final thing I want to talk about are app templates. So we've been through the three big pillars, um, Microsoft Graph, the Teams UI and bots. But I did want to spend some time telling you about app templates because I think they're amazing. So. What if I told you that Microsoft had a collection of Microsoft Teams applications that are fully working applications? They've been written by Microsoft and the community. You can deploy them into your Azure tenant really easily. There's proper documentation, there's proper architecture diagrams and cost estimations. They're completely open source, so you can change them if you wish, and they're completely free. That's what app templates are. There's a whole load of them available today that are solving common business problems. So before you jump in and think you have to write a whole load of code for whatever it is your organization needs, go take a look at app templates. See if they have what you need. Let's look at an example. So list search is a particular app template that surfaces information in SharePoint lists and exposes it inside a messaging extension, just like the one we were just looking at. It's really easy to set up um, and you can just follow the instructions, deploy it into your Azure tenant and have it working within half an hour. So what does that actually mean? So you go follow the links and you end up on a page that looks like this. Well, this is the landing page for the list search app template. And if you're not familiar with GitHub, this can look a bit off putting, but don't worry, look kind of below the halfway point where the title is and start reading from there. There's some text that tells you about what it is, and there's three links, and all app templates have these three links, documentation, deployment guide, and architecture. So if you go into the documentation, you get like a proper page of information about what it is, how it works, you've got some nice screenshots. If you go to the deployment guide, it tells you in English what you have to do, and you don't have to be a developer to understand what you're being told in the deployment guide. If you can follow these instructions, just follow basic instructions, you can get this deployed and configured in your tenant. And finally, if you're 
being asked how your application is being made up, if IT want to know, or if you're just curious yourself, there's a proper solution overview that tells you how it's all tied together um, and how it all works. So definitely go check out app templates, see what's available, and if it's the right thing for you, you might as well start using them because it's way easier than um, building something from scratch. If you're a developer, it's a really good learning tool. If you've never done anything with Microsoft Teams apps, the app templates are a really good um, kind of way of seeing what best practice looks like because a lot of them have been written by Microsoft developers, so they are kind of um, they're really good kind of well-written applications that have been fully tested and, and kind of checked. The architecture in them is sound. Um, so they, and, and so if you're unsure about how to do something, you can use them as a way of um, kind of figuring out how Microsoft would do it. So we've covered quite a few things. Um, there's lots of ways you can get started. I've put lots and lots of links on the screen and I'll put them in the notes as well. So. If you haven't already built an application for Microsoft Teams, why not? There's What's stopping you? There's so many tools out there to help you. This is a really exciting, evolving space. By building applications for Microsoft Teams, you can help users by bringing their data to them inside the place where they're already collaborating and communicating inside Microsoft Teams. By doing that, you're only gonna make them more productive and happier. So it's a really empowering thing to do. So give it a go today, especially if you've never done it before. I think you might be surprised at what happens.